So what influences jurors? So I've already said that the biggest influence on jurors' decisions is the strength of the evidence against the defendant. Now we turn to how factors other than the evidence influence jurors' decisions. Obviously, these are the things we want to know about so that we can reduce their effects. Let's start with the characteristics of the defendant. Physically attractive defendants are more likely to be acquitted or receive a lighter sentence. This is true as long as the defendant didn't use his or her attractiveness to actually carry out the crime. For example, by swindling somebody out of money by romancing them. The defendant's race also has an effect on the jury. In the United States of America, black defendants are more likely to be sent to prison. In fact, racial minorities are overrepresented in custody around the world. For example, not only in the United States of America, but also in the United Kingdom and Australia. There is reasonable evidence from meta-analyses across many studies that there is a main effect of defendant race. This means that people from negatively stereotyped racial groups tend to be more likely to be convicted. Okay, so there is evidence that defendants from some categories are seen as being more likely to be guilty. There is some more research which suggests that the story is more complicated than this, however. The short story is that defendants seem to be seen as more likely to be guilty only when they come from social categories that are stereotypically linked to the features of the particular crime they are said to have committed. A good example of this can be seen in research by Gordon and colleagues in 1988. In that study, they found that when the defendant's race matched the type of crime the defendant was said to have committed, the defendant was evaluated more negatively. In particular, a white defendant was punished more than a black defendant when the alleged crime was embezzling money, whereas the opposite was true when the alleged crime was burglary. You can find another example of exactly the same type of effect in a study by Bodenhausen in 1990. One of the factors that contributes to higher conviction rates in these types of cases was identified by Jones and Kaplan in 2003. They found that when the defendant matched race-based expectations for the type of crime allegedly committed, mock jurors sought less additional information to help them make a decision and instead tended to rely on their pre-existing stereotypes. We get similar effects based on socioeconomic status as well. So there's reasonable evidence that the reason why people from some racial or ethnic groups are sometimes seen as more likely to be guilty is because stereotypes about those groups are linked to particular types of crime. So we know that the defendant's attractiveness, the race, socioeconomic status, all influence how jurors see them. What about the defendant's gender? In a similar vein, non-experimental researchers found that prosecutors are less likely to file charges against female compared to male narcotic offenders. Uh, judges are more likely to grant women pretrial release than they are to male offenders. And women face lower odds of incarceration following trial compared to men. The relationship between defendant gender and judgments is more complicated. There doesn't appear to be a simple overall main effect of defendant gender, except perhaps for punishment. Sometimes men are seen as more guilty and sometimes women are treated more harshly. A good example of the first type of effect can be seen in a meta-analysis across a large number of studies by Dean and colleagues in 2000. That study showed that male defendants were more likely to be found guilty of some particular types of crimes, particularly assault and theft. Another good example of the first type of effect can be seen in a research by McCoy and Gray in 2007. In this paper, they found that the mock jurors, people pretending to be jurors for the purposes of the study, believed the victim more when the defendant was described as being a man compared to a woman. In other words, the defendant seemed more guilty when he was a man rather than a woman. The explanation that is generally given for these types of effect is that men are stereotypically seen as having more of the characteristics consistent with being a criminal. In particular, they're seen as more aggressive and assertive and so on. Now you might be wondering, isn't it perfectly irrational to think that a male defendant is more likely to be guilty than a female defendant? After all, the vast majority, as in well over 90%, of all people charged and convicted of crimes, especially those involving violence, are men. So it seems that the stereotype is based on accurate facts in this particular example, i.e. the base rate for offending is strongly skewed towards male offenders. Why can't we just make a probabilistic judgment based on these base rates and convict male defendants? Well, the problem arises because defendants are not selected at random. When police investigate a case, they don't just choose any random person on the street and charge them with the offence. Police investigate someone based on non-random factors, for example, a tip-off or a witness identification, and so base rate information is actually irrelevant for deciding whether the defendant is guilty or not. Thus, jurors should make their decisions based only on the evidence presented at trial.
Now, on the other hand, there's evidence that sometimes female defendants are treated more harshly compared to male defendants. Wayne and colleagues in 2001 found that a woman who sexually harassed a man was viewed more negatively than a man who sexually harassed a woman, possibly due to stereotypes about traditional sex roles and sexual aggressiveness. Vicky and colleagues in 2005 found that a female who murdered a number of children was evaluated more negatively by participants who scored higher on a measure of sexism. There's also some evidence that women get evaluated more negatively because they seem to be out of place in the criminal justice system, and so their behaviour is seen as particularly abnormal. So why might these types of effects reverse in this way? Well, there are a few possible reasons. The first has to do with how we think about men and women in comparison to gender-based standards and the types of questions we're asking ourselves. A zero-sum or absolute judgment task like deciding whether the defendant is guilty or not will tend to encourage seeing the defendants in terms of the stereotype associated with them. For example, when thinking about the guilt of a male defendant, we might think he's guilty because we see him in terms of the male stereotype, which is more consistent with the attributes of a criminal. When the task is a subjective one, in that we're asking ourselves how much of some attribute a defendant has, for example, how aggressive the defendant's behaviour was, then we contrast that behaviour with our expectations for their gender. In this case, we would see a female defendant's behaviour as being more aggressive than a male defendant's behaviour, even if they had both objectively acted in exactly the same way. This is called shifting standards. A final reason is related to thinking about jurors as cognitive optimizers. We talked about this in the previous video. Remember we talked about how when a defendant is stereotypical, perceivers have more cognitive capacity to think about other things, such as the strength of the evidence against the defendant. This means that when the case is strong, jurors will be more likely to convict the defendant, and when the case is weak, they'll be more likely to acquit. Now, because female defendants can't easily be represented by a stereotype, jurors should be relatively insensitive to the strength of the case against the female defendant. And so, when the case is weak, jurors should tend to acquit the male more compared to the female defendant. And the opposite should happen when the case is strong. Right, so we've spent a bit of time talking about how the defendant's attributes can influence how jurors evaluate them. Now, while these can be pretty difficult to change, research is starting to identify some of the ways to potentially reduce their effects. Now, we probably don't have the time to get into those now, as so we could spend another whole course talking about how to reduce the effect of stereotypes. But we can turn our eye to something that influences jurors' verdicts that is also actually pretty easy to change. We're talking about the order in which jurors are asked to decide verdicts in cases involving more than one verdict. This can happen, for example, in a murder case. A jury might be asked to decide whether the defendant is guilty of murder, and if not murder, manslaughter, and if not that, perhaps some lesser charge. Greenberg, Williams and O'Brien in 1986 gave participants a condensed version of a murder trial. The possible verdicts were first degree murder, second degree murder, voluntary manslaughter, involuntary manslaughter, or not guilty. After being given about six pages of judicial instructions by the experimenter, Participants were asked to consider the verdicts either from harshest to most lenient, as, in the, as is usual in murder trials, or from most lenient to harshest. The results showed that participants gave harsher verdicts when they were asked to consider the first degree murder as the first possible verdict option compared to when they were asked to consider not guilty as the first possible verdict option. Greenberg and colleagues thought that this was due to a confirmation bias which is the idea that when given a hypothesis to test, we tend to look for information that confirms rather than contradicts that hypothesis. So when participants were given a hypothesis by the first proposed verdict option, they focused on the evidence in the case that was consistent with that verdict. When given first degree murder as the first verdict, participants were more influenced by evidence suggesting guilt. When given not guilty as the first verdict, they were more influenced by evidence suggesting that the defendant was innocent. So that's a number of things that influence individuals' decisions. One thing we haven't talked about that has received quite a deal of attention in the research is expert evidence. While stereotypes and schemas are important for how we evaluate expert testimony, it's worth spending a bit more time in the next video talking about this type of testimony because there are some additional unique issues to do with experts and their testimony.